Okay, guys, I'm here today with Henry Aikens. Huge honor for me. Guys, Henry just shot an entire structure all about his cross side domination. And if you follow Henry, you know like how many hidden details he has on every single position. So today he's gonna show us a little bit of, uh, uh, of some of the details that he used on the side control. And guys, for those who doesn't know Henry, he is the third American black belt from Hickson Gracie, and he was the head instruction he had instructor of Hickson Gracie Academy for the longest time, right, Henry? Yeah, so, so 10 years I taught at Hickson School. Yeah, so, I mean, like, the this is the one who probably drink <laughs> the most from the font, right? <laughs> so, I, I, I try to live at the academy just so I can learn as much as I can from the master, so. Yeah, yeah. no, and uh, I, I learn from you nowadays, and I can see how much you learn. So, let's it's do it, all the Henry. details. So, okay, lay down, and we're going to talk about the cross-eye position. So, um, one of the main things about basically attacking from the cross side in order for me to attack from the cross side one of the main things i want to do is i want to be able to control my opponent right i want to be able to prevent him from escaping and so one of the first things that we're always thinking about when we're trying to escape from the cross side is this guy trying to turn on his side if he can get on his side right it gives him a much better chance of getting out and so that's why one of the things you always hear coaches talking about when they're you know in competition or whatever you always hear them yelling get to your side get to your side get to your side so one of the main elements one of the most important things for me to control is basically the shoulders or the arms when I'm cross-eyed, okay? So I either wanna control his shoulders or his arms to basically prevent him from getting to his side. So one of the positions that I really like to get to is what I call a super chill position. And the super chill position is basically when I have one arm underneath his armpit, okay? So basically an underhook, I'm always trying to get the underhook to the far side arm. And the second one I'm doing is I'm gonna pluck this elbow, okay? So once I'm in this position, I'm gonna show you guys how I set up this position. So once I get underneath, one of the things I always do with this hand is I always rest it on the side of my face, okay? The reason I rest it on the side of my face is because once I scoop this arm up, if my hand is just controlling his shoulder, he can use this arm to bother me. He can basically frame, he can push against my face, he can start to push my collar to try to push me off. So I don't want him to be able to use this arm. So underhook, hand on the side of my face. And the other thing I do is I pinch my elbow underneath his armpit. So if my elbow's out here, he can pull his arm out, pull your arm out. Yep, pull, good. If it's here, pull your arm out. No way. Okay, good. So here, knees are gonna be underneath his shoulder. And then I'm also off my butt. So that's one of the things from cross-eyed. I'm always putting pressure on my opponent. I always want my weight on my opponent. And we see how much using weight distribution and pressure tires people out, right? I'm already so it's tired already, here. It's already uncomfortable and hard yep. for you to breathe, right? And so once I get to this position, the nice thing is, is I have so many different attacks available from here, okay? So from here, because I'm controlling this elbow and because I, I'm underneath this arm, it's really difficult for Bernardo to turn on his side. So try to turn one no way, way or the other. Yeah, hard turn this way. Yeah. What happens is the more he tries to turn and pull this elbow down, actually just because of the prep, just ah. because I'm a little bit connected, when he pulls his elbow down, it actually pulls my body yeah. through him. So what you can worse. feel is, you feel how yeah. I got a little bit heavier, and then yeah. when you relax it, yeah. right? So pull that arm down. There's no, no way. And if you try to turn this way, because of this arm, this if he, if he tries to turn this way, this arm is under control. So what I'm doing is I'm doing a really good job of keeping him flat, right? Now, once I can manage to keep him flat, and the reason I have my hips turned is actually, my hips are turned like this to prevent any guard recovery, right? Because yep. if he's on his back, now he turns his knee, there's no way he can put me in the guard. If my, if my leg is like this, further back, now he can sneak his knee inside. So I'm always turning, keeping my weight on my opponent, right? So from here, what's nice is I have multiple, multiple attacks, okay? One of the first attacks that I'll always go for is this paper cutter, okay? One of the things I do with the paper cutter, what's really important is when I go for the paper cutter, I want to make sure that my opponent is looking straight up. I'm going to take a little bit of weight off Bernardo just to make it. Thanks so much, Harry. I appreciate it. <laughs> so one of the most important things about the paper cutter is we want him looking up. If he turns his neck to the side and I try to go for a paper cutter, it's it's uncomfortable, but it's not. I'm not going to get the finish, Okay, especially against someone that's tough. So when I attack the paper cutter, what I always do is I always use my wrist to turn the chin. So try to turn and look. Yep. And then my hand weaves around and then I can just grab. So I just cut my fingers here on the shoulder. And the important thing is my elbow kicks out. So try to turn your chin. All right. So now I basically locked his chin in place. If my elbow is here, he can turn his head, right? Yeah. 
So even if he's got his head turned, so a lot of times people will be trying to turn on their side like this. My hand just goes here right next to his chin, right? I turn and I'm already keeping my elbow kicked out. And then I just start to walk my fingers down and start to put pressure. Now, a lot of times I know when I start to do this, he's going to defend. How would he defend? Well, normally he's gonna to try to push my elbow, right? Or hug it, yep. So if he hugs it, oh my God, I trap, yep. right? So anytime he uses this arm against me, I basically trap it between my legs, okay? So now try to pull that arm out. No try way. to see if you can get your arm out. It's stuck. And then I count, I reattack, okay? And I always attack coming from this side, turning the chin, and basically walking my fingers back to attack the paper cutter. Now, if he uses this hand against me, right? I'm gonna an Americana. So that's the nice thing about keeping the arm on this side of the head is anytime this hand, he tries to use his hand to help, ah, I have an Americana, right? Anytime he uses this hand, if he pushes my arm, so push it, yep. I basically step ah. over and I have this arm lock. Ah. If he pulls this arm down, yep. Like maybe he would be trying to get to the side or maybe he tries to pull my arm down for a paper cutter, right? I just stuff it. Yes. And then I can attack the neck. So basically from this position, kind of this arm, anything he does with this arm, it's under attack. Anything he does with this arm is under attack. And I'm also attacking the neck. And so that's really important that I basically constantly have the ability to threaten. And anything he does ends up becoming a mistake, right? And so what you'll notice is once I get to this position, not only am I attacking him with my weight, right? Because the pressure starts to become unbearable. If I'm here long enough, he's going to really panic to escape. He tries to pull this arm down, pull this arm down to try to get to your side. Yep. I stuff it. This is a peak the Greek special. Wrist I can always lock yeah. wrist lock from ah. here, yeah. right? Or paper cutter. And if you bring this hand around, ah, oh Americana. my God. No, that's crazy. And this is a amazing position. So this is a position I call cross-eyed crucifix, where basically I have his arms out to like the side. Six. Yeah. So if, in the situation of a fight, right? Look what I have. So this is yes. really important for us is that now his face is completely exposed. There's no way that he can stop me from basically doing strikes, right? Yeah. So. No, go ahead, Harry. So amazing position because not only am I attacking him with my weight, which actually if I'm able to just maintain that position, especially if we've been training or rolling for a little bit, just that pressure and the weight on his chest, he will tap over time. So if I can just maintain this position, especially during a roll, the longer I can stay there, basically the more opportunity I have to finish because the, the weight itself is a choke, right? It's an asphyxiation. So because of that, now he can't rest from the cross side. You didn't feel like you were resting there, right? You yep. felt like you were kind of draining your energy. You're getting more tired just from yep. the pressure on your chest. So as he tries to escape, all of these attacks open up, right? And if he doesn't try to escape, and I'm, I'm in a hurry to finish, then I immediately just start putting pressure on the neck. I immediately just start to attack the neck because what'll happen is in order for him to defend his neck, his hands have to come into play. He has to start to use his hands. And then once he starts to use his hands, I can either trap the arm or I can start to attack the arm or I can basically, you know, attack the neck or so. Basically, it's a really, really powerful position to really start to implement your attacks. Got it. Oh, here, quick question here. Yeah. So most of the people, when they get the side control, mm -hmm. I think they, they follow the principles, they try to keep the person flat and control both arms, mm -hmm. but it's always if both knees on the ground and use this knee to... Right. So always our first option is to go to that move. So, so yeah, what you normally see from, uh, I think, cross-eyed is it's more exactly a position this. like this, Ex right? Yeah. So what, what we're talking about is a head and arm control. Okay. Right? Because I have your head under control and your arm under control, and then I have both knees on the ground, and normally guys are holding really tight here. And it's the same principle, right? I'm flat and you have to control right. both arms, so right? So basically, so because I have the underhook, what happens is it prevents you from being able to turn on your side because your shoulder, if you try to turn on your side, your shoulder gets caught on my shoulder. So, yep, you see how your arm gets caught on my shoulder? Yep. So this is a method to basically be able to control a person and keep them flat. Okay. The problem with this method is that there's no pressure. There's no weight distribution. In order for me to create pressure, right, I actually have to squeeze with my arms. So in order for me to create pressure, I have to use my own energy yep. to create pressure, yep. right? And usually that requires either squeezing with my arms or sometimes what happens is people can lean on the face, yep. which is really, really uncomfortable, yep. but it doesn't take your breath away. It's not, it's not affecting your cardio. I agree. If you're tough and I put this pressure on your face, it's really uncomfortable, but, right? but you can yeah. breathe. 
this is different, right? Yes. Does it feel harder to breathe? It's so if I said, hey, Bernardo, you need to hang out here for the next three minutes. It's horrible. Do you think you can hang out here for three minutes? No. Right? Uh, so what happens is that you feel how normal my breath is. So I'm able to create pressure, an incredible amount of pressure on you without using any energy. I agree. I'm just using no. my weight. And what happens is from, from this position, right? Now I can attack because what you notice is this arm. Th that's it, what I would say. Yeah, when you're here, you think I think you have a very good control, but not so many weapons, right? I have. So here's the thing: with my arm, with this arm on underneath your head, I can't punch you. Yep. I can't elbow you. Almost, okay? you can't submit me. I can't. Um, if you bring this arm in front of my face, bring that arm in front of me. I can't go for an americana. Yep. I agree. Right? And I have no paper cutter choke. I agree. Okay. Yeah, I think the only benefit of being here compared to the other situation is going to the mount, right? Here is an easier path to the mount. Uh, not necessarily. Yeah, yes, it, it's it's a mount. Like I can go basically neon belly to mount, or yeah, or yeah. you know we can switch our legs yeah, to step yeah. over mount. But I can mount you from, from here, here as, well. as well. How would you do that? Right. So so a lot of times, look, I just put my head here. Oh and man, slide I think over, I know. Yeah, right. No, so I, I can slide right. over to mount. Yeah. So that's that's the other thing too is if I post on my head. I can easily slide over to mount, or I can always do this, right? Yeah. And then and then step over to mount. So I can always transition. But that's the thing is I don't want my arm. So for me, when I when I hold cross side, I almost never put my arm underneath the head because it takes away my ability to use weight. Yeah. With my arm on the ground here, yeah. there's no weight distribution on you. I'm not yeah. able to use my weight. My weight is in my arms, yeah. right? Because my arms are on the ground. Yeah. And I lose out on all of the attacks on this side yep so there's no americana because my arm is underneath your head i can't go for a kimura because my arm is underneath here and i can't go for the straight arm lock yep so that's the crazy thing is from this position if you think about it all the attacks i have not only am i attacking you with my pressure right? ah. but i can start to bother your neck i can start to threaten your neck right yep. i can hit if it's a fight yeah right? and i can start to attack this arm too yep. so even here like ah. i can go for wrist locks Right? If you put your hand inside, ah. I can start to attack with my legs yeah. and start to threaten. And the other thing too is I have this, this ah. attack here, right? Yes. So I can basically... Yeah, no, I love how your arms are able to attack, you know, like in the other situation, your arms are stuck and you're right. busy controlling the position. So over here, you're using your weight distribution Yeah, so control. my body and my weight controls you yeah. and my arms are available to attack. So that's yeah. a very common theme that, that's something that Hickson was really big on teaching us is how we use our body to control so that the arms are always available to attack, yep. right? So I want my arms, and not only attack, but to be able to hit. So same thing from the mount, right? When yep. I'm mounted, I want my arms free. I don't want to be controlling with my arms so much, even though my arms are there to help, yep. right? My legs are mostly there. My legs are wrapped around the person. My legs are there to control the position. My arms are there to hit, to punch, uh, to attack if no. I need to. And it almost reminded me of the back attack as well. Because nowadays, <laughs> everybody is doing back attacks using mm -hmm. the legs to trap the arms, right? Right. And it's kind of what you're doing from there. You're trapping my arm with my legs and, and then yeah, everything so, is available from there. So what we're, what we're constantly doing is, A, I want to have multiple attacks available yep. so that, A, it creates pressure. Like... The, the weight distribution creates pressure, creates yeah, mental and yeah, physical pressure. I'm like he's meshed here. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. So that creates pressure, it creates a panic almost. Yep. And then I have the arm to attack, I have the neck to attack, so I have multiple things to attack. Yep. And what that does is it creates a psychological pressure where yep. you just start to feel overwhelmed. Like, oh my gosh, like there's so many things that you have to deal with, you can't defend them all at once. Well, and when you were in a match, just the fact that you passed that guy's guard is already like tiring. He was resisting, yes. he was he didn't want to get his guard passed and that. And then when you get to side control, if you do that, I yeah. bet some people might tap from right. that. Just like so that's the thing is if you're already tired because you're fresh right now and you're feeling it, yep. just imagine if you're maybe yep. two, three, four minutes into a match yep. and then someone ends up in that position. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. So that's that cross side position is is uh what I call the super chill position because it looks like I'm just chilling out, which I yep. am. I'm just yep. You know, again, f the principles of jujitsu, right? I want to be conserving energy. I want to be relaxed. I don't yep. want to be wasting energy, but I want you to be wasting energy. I want oh, yeah. you oh. gassing out, right? Because we can see that in all the matches, once someone starts to tire, once someone starts to gas, their performance drops. Okay. So the goal is to constantly, how can I make my opponent tired quicker? Yeah. Especially if I'm if, if they're more athletic than me. Yeah, and a big part of our audience is older people. Yeah. And uh, I think like this is great for them because many times the young athletic kids, they're not worried about making you tired. They're worried about finding a way to go to your back. And uh, and when you get older, 
Yeah. You'll lose that flexibility. And, and movement, right? Yeah. And movement and speed. And so yeah. what happens is from this position, what you see is there's not a lot of movement involved. Like I'm not, I'm not changing the position. I don't have to change the position. All of the attacks start to become available from that position. Whether it's the Americana, a lot of times people reach around. Yeah. Whether it's this arm lock, I can basically, there's a step over arm lock where I step over your head. I can start to attack your neck. And so basically from that position, all of these things start to become available. Yeah. And even if not, even if I don't have like an arm or a neck, eventually the weight distribution will tap you because oh, yeah. you're no, what sense. happens is with your breathing muscles like this is important for people to understand bernardo with the weight distribution and why i've spent so much time really trying to develop it and learn it is because your breathing muscles are just like any other muscles in your body yep. okay there's actually like 36 different muscles that help you to breathe and so your breathing muscles are either strong or they're weak okay right so even if you have strong breathing muscles, even if your breath breathing is really strong, what happens is just like any other muscle, they get tired over time. Yes. So imagine if I said, hey, Bernardo, you need to lift 100 pounds. You could do that easy 10 yep. times. But if I said, hey, Bernardo, you need to bench 100 pounds and I need you to do it 60 or 70 times. Yep. Probably when you get to 30, 40, you start to get a little tired, yep. right? Yep. Yep. So the same thing with your breathing. By putting my weight on your chest, in order for you to breathe, your lungs need to expand, yep. right? The lungs need to expand. So when you take a deep breath, you feel your lungs expand and fill up with oxygen. And then when you breathe out, they yep. compress. Yep. So just like this with your breathing muscles, what happens is if I put my weight on your chest, every time you breathe, you have to move my weight. And even though the first few breaths maybe it's fine. What happens is over time, those breathing muscles start to get tired because every time you need to expand, to open your lungs, right? You have to move my weight. You have to lift my weight off you. And this is why many times um, you hear about people dying when something heavy falls on their chest, like in yep. an earthquake or something like that, something heavy falls on their chest. And what happens is eventually there's so much pressure and compression on the lungs that they basically die from suffocation. They get asphyxi asphyxiation yep. because the lungs can't expand anymore. Okay. Oh, here, quick question. So uh you know a lot about human physiology almost like how do you learn that do you read about it how because that's a very interesting aspect of jiu-jitsu that i think like if you understand that it's much easier to understand jiu-jitsu and to teach jiu-jitsu but how do you yeah i think i think all of it just came from a i, I have a science background i have a background in science yeah, so yeah. i used to go to school for um my my kind that of major was biology yeah, and yeah, so you have yeah. to take classes on physiology and yeah. anatomy and all that stuff um, so I did that when I was very young, but also just from doing jujitsu, you kind of learn how the human body works and especially breath work. Hickson was really, really big on breathing, yep, right? yep, and understanding yeah, breath yep. work. And so he actually mentions that that was one of the biggest contributors to his success in jujitsu is yep. his breathing and his ability to basically get enough oxygen so that he could keep his heart rate lower so that as other people were gassing, he was still kind of normal. He could turn it up. And basically he would gas people out and so his his ability to relax and be very relaxed in training his uh precision with the technique which means anytime he does something that it didn't cost him much energy he, he was never forcing things yep. and his ability to breathe is what allowed him really to to dominate everyone because he his yeah. energy his his cardio was so good he never gets tired yeah because he know how to breathe and etc i would see him literally uh guys would come from brazil um during the Pan Ams, back when the Pan Ams were in yep. Los Angeles, and there would literally be like 30 black belts come from Brazil. He would sit in the middle of the mat and line everyone and up, everybody. line them all up on the mat, and he would bring one guy out at a time. He would tap this guy out five or six times, and then he would go back to the wall, and the next guy would come out. And he would literally uh, sit crazy. on the mat oh, that's crazy. for two and a half hours without getting a drink of water. That's crazy. He wouldn't even drink water. He would just sit on the mat and basically blow his nose, could bring the next guy and go through 30 guys black yep. belts all black belts that were all you know in their prime getting ready to compete in a big tournament yep. and basically so that level of efficiency was just amazing for me to watch and his breathing was a big part of that yep. so he always talks about how he uses his breathing and you can hear a lot of times when he's like training or competing you know you used to hear this choo, 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 like this type of breathing which is an uh, a pulse exhalation yep. to be able to get the air out so that he could get air back in so yeah just that understanding of how important the breath is yep. makes me realize like okay if i can take away the breath or if i can take away my opponent's ability to breathe yep. then that is basically you know super crucial to their performance yep. right yep. and so that's why weight distribution is so important and you see 
um, a lot of guys actually starting to emphasize that more in their training. Like uh, Gordon yep. talks about pressure and weight, and John's been talking a lot about pressure and yep. weight distribution lately because they're starting to realize the significance, especially when they're dealing with younger, very athletic guys, how to gas these guys out, how to tire them out. So it's not only the technique, but the pressure that they're able to create with their body to gas yeah, people and, uh, out. Watching Gordon competing, it's unbelievable. Like he, his face doesn't change, and you just see the other person like straight crash it. And uh, no, yeah, the... so this is the, they're really developing and, and have a have a good understanding of how to use weight to create pressure. So instead of using strength, which most people when they then they talk about pressure, hear about pressure, most people have to use strength or they're thinking about pulling or squeezing yeah. to create yeah. that pressure. We want to learn to create pressure using our weight okay. because it's free pressure, right? Yeah. It doesn't cost me anything, but it costs you. Yeah. And so by using that pressure, it becomes an attack in itself. Yeah, no, that man, that's amazing. And guys, Harry just shot an entire structure all about his cross side domination. So all his system, when he gets the side control here was just like a small piece of everything he has. So make sure to check it out. It's going to be at bggfanatics.com. And maybe by the time you're watching, it's already there. So check it out. And thanks so much, Harry. Yeah, thanks for now. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys Thank for you. all the support. Please help me out to grow my YouTube channel. Just click subscribe. And to watch more videos, just click under see more videos. I hope you enjoyed. BJJFanatics.com. Use the promo code YouTubeFaria to get 10% off any instructional video. Improve your jujitsu faster.